I am sort of the oddball here in the sense that I come from a strategy and management consulting background uh, where my clients are typically governments, development agencies, or uh, organizations that are concerned with pr uh, producing development outcomes. And innovation and entrepreneurship and higher education are, of course, uh, essential tools in achieving those development outcomes. Um, <clears throat> I've also been given the distinct honor of introducing a very rich topic uh, with 15 minutes to sort of distill my wisdom. So uh, I will accept your invitation to be a little bit provocative, knowing that many of you come from a very diverse set of institutions and contexts um, in which, you know, being too prescriptive sometimes uh, is, is not as effective as, as we'd like to think it is. <clears throat> and I'll start by saying that the world is a contest of ideas. And what do I mean by that? If we think about our ideas, our ideas inform our choices, and our choices are decisions, and our decisions are actions. And so this vast physical medium that we share, that we call the world, is shaped by our thoughts, by our, by our ideas. And so uh, if we think about innovation, and I, I'm sure every conference you've been to, you've heard a different definition of innovation and entrepreneurship, but let's think uh, about what innovation is about. Uh, innovation is really about the liberated potential and possibilities offered by a new idea. And entrepreneuring could be understood um, as being about creating the organization to realize the potential of an idea. So that means that, yes, a startup can be uh, you know, an example of being entrepreneurial, but large companies and organizations can be entrepreneurial. Um, and of course, uh, it doesn't matter if it's a social enterprise or uh, something that's uh, for economic value. <clears throat> now, what's important about starting the discussion here is that no one has a monopoly on new ideas. Right? And if we think about this uh, deceptively simple and intuitive chain, um, we start to think that you know, psychology, sociology, culture, you know, anthropology, uh, these are all factors in terms of understanding uh, how we shape our world. So <clears throat> we, could, we could argue that the social sciences could lead the natural sciences in a deliberate process of innovation in entrepreneurship by understanding the human condition and human contexts, perhaps better than um, just focusing on discovery and um, trying to figure out, based on a new capability, how to push it out into the world. <clears throat> Culture, for example, is a form of micropolicy. And one of the things that we have to avoid as consultants going into different contexts and different cult, you know, cultures um, is to appear to create any sort of value judgments about a culture. Um, but if you think about culture as micropolicy, people are self-governing their behavior uh, based on their set of beliefs and values. Um, it affects a lot how you go from ideas and, and what options you think you have and, and what decisions you choose to make and what actions you take. So uh, we, we, we talk about this in terms of introducing entrepreneurship as a career path for uh, students. And we talk about this in terms of unlocking the mind in terms of how to generate innovative ideas. So it's really about teaching people how to think um, before they even engage in the process of starting a new enterprise. Now, the more fundamental idea that is contested, uh, the greater potential for innovation. Uh, you could also say that if there are ideas that we don't contest about the world, uh, we'll be forever limited by those ideas. Um, so in a way, being innovative is in a way being insubordinate. That's a very different view then if you think about the disciplined approach to education in which, you know, I recall in my schooling days, going to school, being very passive, not questioning the teacher, sitting with my hands crossed. So we want, to, we want students to learn about the world, but we want them to also imagine a world that maybe does not exist. And I would go further by saying that in a free market capitalist system, again, no one has a monopoly on creating a new enterprise. So uh, it's actually, uh, in a free market capital system, something that we have to be proficient at doing in order to solve problems for our society. 
And of course, entrepreneurship itself or entrepreneuring is, is something that's, uh, by the way, I speak a derivative of English uh, being an American and uh, we take liberty with uh, <laughs> inventing new terminology that you know perhaps we should adopt the British term of enterprising or something. But uh, more and more people are referring to it as entrepreneuring being an act of rather than entrepreneurship being the state of something. Um, but it's an organizational challenge. How do we organize so that we can realize the potential of a new idea? <clears throat> I suppose I could take questions during my talk or leave it towards the end. I'll leave that to you, Richard, if you think, uh, towards the end, okay, fair enough. <clears throat> uh, now, Wendy just mentioned uh, you know, something very interesting in relation to mindset versus skill set. And again, many places we go, we, we, ha we cannot take for granted what we assume to be um, the mindset of individuals. And whether it's internationally or domestically, um, there's a lot of obstructive thinking. In other words, people are saying, well, can you teach someone to be an entrepreneur or is that just their calling? Are they just motivated to be an entrepreneur? And we find that you know, there's a lot of obstructions in people's minds that just they've been conditioned by their upbringing, their surroundings, their culture, their context. And you know, we, we hear these are actual things that we've heard. You know, it's always been that way. And who am I to change things? And I'm powerless. I don't have choice. And I, I better play it safe. You know, there's too much risk, and I, I can't afford risk. And I can't do that. Or you know, I could even tell you an interesting story uh, in Tunisia. This is the Ben Ali, you know, dictatorship uh, several years ago. Um, a very bureaucratic place where commerce was controlled by um, a, a few connected families that we actually had a young student innocently ask, well, what form should I fill out if I want to be an entrepreneur? And you know, it, it's, it's a very innocent, honest question. And, and sometimes it's, these are obstructions are, are you know, perceived. And sometimes they're much more um, real. Now, as a graduate student at MIT more than 10 years ago, I experienced my own you know, mindset shift, if you will where uh, I took a very simple uh, a course on developmental ventures, it was called. So uh, very simple syllabus, solve a problem that affects one billion people. And so, you know, at the time I thought, wow, who am I to think about a problem that affects one billion people? You know, I'm worried about getting, on, getting to class on time. <laughs> and uh, then I thought, you know, well, who am I not to? Right? And you can start to see how your mind shifts as you apply it to different problems in different contexts. And uh, it's part of the process of creating that entrepreneurial mindset. I would also mention that being at a place like MIT, where the culture of the university uh, is very much about not only new ideas, and of course, you know, people are disappointed when they find out internationally that uh, I went to the business school and not uh, the engineering school, of course. but. Um, that you know, there's so many inventions and, 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 and innovations that come from MIT um, that it's almost become synonymous or an expectation of the culture that um, you're going to start a company when you leave, or you'll likely join some of your classmates who, who have. And so an, a, a related subject in terms of where do these ideas come from, sometimes what we know blinds us to what we don't know. And you know, our, own, um, you know, our own education can actually get in the way of, of our ability to be innovative and to develop winning ideas. And so uh, again, you know, ideas have an origin. If we have a different lens on life, a different belief system, culture, or uh, even uh, an education that gives us a set of frameworks and tools, we might think like an engineer, or think like a lawyer, or think like uh, a business person. But um, you know, through multidisciplinary education, uh, the liberal arts. Um, cross-registration of uh, across campuses, we can start open, opening our minds um, and appreciating different views of the world that give us um, a new lens, a uh, new lens at looking at the world and really thinking about um, the greater potential for innovative, you know, uh, really think about how that contributes to the greater potential for innovative thinking. The same way diversity in a classroom or on a team also contributes to innovative thinking. So um, 
it's, <clears throat> you know, it, it, if you think about it, diversity contributes to innovative thinking and multiple disciplinary education offers diverse thinking through, you know, frameworks and tools. Now, the, if the longer I spend on this slide, the more political the discussion is going to become. So I'm not going to spend too much time, but to, to illustrate very quickly, um, the contest of ideas, if you were to look at this horizontal dotted line with a dollar sign next to it, you could argue that the placement of that line uh, describes for us the Cold War, right? Who controls wealth, the public or the private sector? And today it's the 99 percenters for those of you who follow sort of domestic politics. Um, how is wealth allocated between economic and social causes? This tool, you know, you can apply it to a very different context. If, if my wealth creation happens, let's say, in an uh, oil-rich country like Saudi Arabia or the United Arab Emirates, the public sector might be actually where uh, wealth creation happens and, you know, industry is actually a derivative of public sector spending. But in the case of, again, a free market capitalist system, wealth creation happens through private economic activity Government revenue is a derivative or it's derived from, you know, taxes which come from taxing uh, private sector wealth. And you could argue that well, maybe the exception of, uh, of uh, social enterprises that have sustainable business models, but civil society itself also survives off of donations and, found in, in, in government contributions. Um, and I think the most important thing to illustrate here, however, is that academia acts as the supply chain for our entire society. So, you know, you could argue that under communism, you can imagine it as one giant corporation. You know, talk about too big to fail, right? <laughs> but uh, in a free market capitalist system, you need the regenerative process of, uh, of entrepreneurship for that creative destruction to continually generate wealth and to allow all of our society to prosper, including academic institutions. So if we think about it, all of the benefits of, you know, job creation, right? We know jobs come from companies, right? So companies create jobs, jobs, you know, employees create products, products generate sales, exports, financial returns, all of that wealth creation activity comes from creating companies. Uh, and of course, uh, as Wendy, you mentioned, uh, with down market scenarios, everyone says, well, now all these other sectors have to do something because this wealth creating capacity has been diminished. Uh, so the reason innovation and entrepreneurship are important to academic institutions has a lot to do with the relevance and value that they provide. And in particular, in a free market uh, capitalist system, we could argue how could we have gone on so long not focusing on becoming proficient or highly proficient at new enterprise creation. And um, I would argue that being the source of new ideas and successful new enterprises could pay huge dividends for academic institutions, you know, by attracting the best students, faculty, uh, corporate sponsors, and, you know, financial resources. Now, we, they say that the only constant is change, and there's a, there's a, a number of drivers that are really uh, that surround this discussion. Uh, I'll point to the high bar of you know the potential of entrepreneurship, and uh, really in terms of uh, the Kauffman Foundation study that happened in 2009. Professor Ed Roberts at MIT is the chairman of the MIT Entrepreneurship Center. Uh, discovered that if the graduates of MIT formed their, if their companies formed an independent nation, the revenues generated by that nation would make it the 17th largest economy in the world. Now, some people look at this and they say, oh, did you really have to say that and, you know, <laughs> disappoint us and, you know, schools, some schools don't have engineering, you know, world-class engineering schools with a, a world-class business school. But the point is, this is the potential and this is what people look at when they start to increase their expectations of academic institutions. Uh, but, you know, we know that globalization um, uh, is important to the discussion as well. Uh, it's a zero-sum game. A job created in China is one less job created in the United States. And as increasingly knowledge-based societies, uh, education or higher education is no longer just for an elite few, but uh, it's, it's a necessity. So with rising unemployment, rising debt, including student loan debt, 
everyone's looking for, you know, with increased expectations, the, the wealth creating capacity of uh, our society to be unleashed. And you could argue that academic institutions that are producing innovative ideas or new ideas about the world, they should want to see these vehicles created so that their ideas don't remain academic and so that they find their place in the world and that they shape the world that we live in. So, you know, we have a rising set of expectations that only can be satisfied by engaging in a race to the top and only by unlocking the potential of individual students or I should say human beings who can express their unique value to the world and, you know, express that through their own economic self-determination. Um, we will otherwise be stuck in a race to the bottom competing in commodity-based industries for lowest wages and it's a, it's a race you lose when you win. So with, you know, with all of these pressures, it's important to point out that dis disruption is on the horizon. So for, for those who have not fully embraced the idea of entrepreneurship education in uh, an academic environment, uh, and believe me, even in places like MIT where it's, it's known for entrepreneurship, there's still that tension between you know, tenure track faculty as being academia and professors of practice uh, who are not second class citizens, but not first class citizens either. Um, so each of you will come from your different context and have your own set of stakeholders and, and, and you'll figure out for yourselves you know, what, you know, how you'll embrace um, these pressures. Um, but disruption is definitely on the horizon that if you don't, others will. And um, you know, there's resources, as we talked about in this wealth contest for wealth, that will be allocated based on your output measures, um, which, by the way, uh, you could infect your, you could affect your input measures uh, by virtue of you know being known for a place where new ideas are born, top talent is created and new enterprises um, are, are growing. So what does it mean to embrace this in terms of you know, multidisciplinary entrepreneurship education and, and the implications for your institution? Well, you know, people build institutions, right? Obvious. And those institutions develop programs that pr generate outputs. And in this case, we're saying human capital and innovation. Very simple value creation process, whatever your specific uh, university, you know, might be uh, about in terms of your colleges and courses of study, uh, it's the same. But now people want, you know, society is demanding that you also add to your output measures new enterprises. So we know that talent drives innovation and innovation drives new enterprise creation. Now what organization do you enact to facilitate this process of new enterprise creation, uh, uh, you know, knowing that it's starting to uh, be something beyond the bounds of your, you know, not only your your reductionist organization in an academic environment designed to create, you know, to generate knowledge and disseminate it, but um, you know, it's it's a transitional. Um, it's a transitional form of organization so that the value that you're creating in the academic institution can be captured for society. And so again, we know that new enterprises create high value employment to generate the wealth that we talk about through you know, products and services that drive sales and exports. The goal then is to figure out you know, for each of these blocks, you know, who are the faculty and what kind of programs do you develop and, 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 and how do you organize uh, in a way to effectively allow uh, entrepreneurship education to exist across the various disciplines within your academic institutions? And, and how do you reap the benefits by developing relationships and programs at each one of these uh, stages so that you know, eventually the wealth that's created can somehow make its way back? And of course, that's where the invitation for your alumni organization is to go hit them up for money. Um, but you're starting to see a system dynamic relationship. So rather than stop at value creation and not uh, really reap so much directly or indirectly uh, the value you're creating for society, uh, the invitation is that if you embrace uh, entrepreneurship education, um, that you will have greater value and relevance to society and potentially generate this virtuous cycle where uh, as you create wealth for society, society can reinvest its wealth back.
So uh, I mentioned, you know, uh, the contest of ideas, and we are we still have an age-old idea that goes back to ancient Greece, which is reductionism as the basis for organizing our academic institutions. And reductionism, you know, can be preserved. So this doesn't have to be a, a debate over whether traditional academia is being threatened by these new demands and this new form of organization. But imagine, you know, your, your silos, your, your, your various disciplines and colleges as, as verticals. Now it's about uh, developing cross-cutting uh, you know, sort of a matrix, matrices or matrix organization for your particular academic institution. And tools to do that at a very broad level are, you know, themes, you know, energy, water, and the environment, human security. And these things can be clustered into related sort of themes. But, you know, what can, uh, what can we learn about uh, potential solutions to problems uh, from, you know, biotechnology or uh, chemistry or physics or, you know, so many different uh, approaches to, let's say, the, the issue of energy or human security or poverty for that. Uh, and then contexts, right? So uh, we're talking about energy in, 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 uh, in what context, for what application, or you know, poverty where, in the inner city or emerging markets, or do we care about the state of Alabama and its economy? So you'll define your own contexts that are important to your own institutions, of course. And then problems, right? Uh, a single problem definition could have many potential solutions. So. Again, you know, I'm, I'm being prescriptive at a high level because the actual way you institute these things in your, your, institu your academic institutions, of course, um, can be of your own choosing. And, um, you know, as being a community, we can all learn from each other. Um, but the idea is why not let the student be a principal investigator and navigate the institution um, you know, across disciplines based on necessity and based on a context and a problem um, that allows him to, or him or her, to learn about entrepreneurship and all the different disciplines that go into being a successful entrepreneur. Um, and then when startups are formed, build community around startups on the campus. This can invite in, you know, external stakeholders, people that are excited about new enterprise creation, uh, lawyers, investors, um, mentors, potential customers. And so, you know, building these communities actually lowers transaction costs for, you know, students starting businesses. The lower the transaction costs, the more you can accelerate these processes and the farther um, that these entrepreneurs can go in starting their businesses. And if you find that, you know, that certain types of um, new enterprises, you know, whether they be social enterprises or women in business or other categories are missing, you can find ways to, uh, uh, you know, influence what students are doing. Um, there's student clubs that, of course, lead, um, you know, that uh, reflect what students' interests are currently. And so tapping into that dynamic, I think, is a way to um, continually be relevant in terms of what students today want. So, you know, ideas for effective entrepreneurial education, by the way, I'm not sure how I am on time. No. Okay. Uh, you know, I'm not going to go through this whole list, but there's so many tools that uh, can be effective in creating multidisciplinary education and entrepreneurship, uh, entrepreneurship education. Uh, let's t start with the action labs which are basically the business cases of the 21st century. You know, students get into a classroom, and at MIT, for example, we used to reserve seats in the business school. 25% of the seats were reserved for engineers. Um, and some, you know, courses, the deliverable, the deliverable was a business plan. So, uh, for example, there's a new enterprises course. One is a life sciences course. So when you're reserving seats for engineers in that particular case, you're looking for life science engineers. And another is more generic uh, and is open to a broader set of engineers. Uh, but through these action labs, you can put together multidisciplinary teams. They can explore ideas as not only um, academic curriculum, but also the starting point for real for new businesses. Uh, another thing that uh, happened recently in the, in the last few years was uh, what's called I-teams. Uh, it's a form of an innovation lab where students are going around to um, uh, different labs within the university and identifying technologies uh, and looking for their various paths to commercialization. Uh, one sec such technology, the, the sort of poster child from the first year of, uh, of the course was called Bronte's Technologies. Um, 
it looked like useless lab research that basically would allow uh, a 2D camera to take a photograph, digitize it, and turn it into 3D images. But the students found that you know, it has applications in, in, in creating dental implants through photographs or through high-speed you know, high manufacturing looking for defects by, by taking photographs. And the company was sold to 3M for $95 million in three years. So you know, if you have the benefit of, of course, an engineering university, you, you'll, you'll have uh, the potential for some of these greater outcomes. But even without them, just again, starting from the point of an idea, right? What are your ideas about the world? Um, you know, innovation doesn't belong to anyone. Uh, you know, I would say that the backbone of, of, you know, a multidisciplinary entrepreneurship education program is your classic entrepreneurship competition in which you can have several categories, you know, and create requirements around teams and, and, and incentivize. Um, but the most important aspect of that is the self-identification where entrepreneurs basically uh, say, yes, uh, I'd like to be an entrepreneur and here's my idea. And it's an invitation to, to support them um, rather than trying to generically encourage people to be entrepreneurs uh, where they may have other interests in mind and, and, mind and, they, and they know really why they came to the university. Um, uh, something very important to being able to innovate and start a new company is becoming familiar with markets, customers, and competitors and gaining access to cumulative research. It's very difficult to have a market success if you don't understand these things. And so, you know, things like pro seminars, if you're talking about uh, people coming in from industry and talking about, uh, you know, technology roadmaps or where their industry is headed, um, you know, on a weekly basis, students can start to learn about the real world and so they can complement uh, academic skill building uh, with real, real, real world problems and experience um, and start to figure out you know, maybe there's an idea that they could exploit. Uh, things like open innovation, you know, studies have shown that this is almost a knowledge arbitrage where um, a chemist will solve the problem that a biologist might have. Uh, it's, uh, it's not that they go off and, and launch an entire research project, but it's just that answers can be found across disciplines um, uh, and, uh, you know, by creating open innovation marketplaces, um, you know, people can communicate basically through problem statements and solutions. Now, one of the things that, you know, I'll point out, and I, I, I'd, I'd like to just, you know, move to questions and answers quickly, but, you know, of course, externships and internships, and uh, there's, there's a way to combine this with globalization in the sense that I, I participated in a course called Global Entrepreneurship Lab, and I spent a month in Brazil working for a Brazilian smart card provider with a team. And so, uh, you know, this is particularly important when you're talking again about zero sum job creation and competition, where competition is much more fierce now. Um, uh, your competitor could come out of India or China or Northern Europe. So, um, <clears throat> you know, but things that I, I think have not been exploited, I think, in, in, in many institutions that I like, is the study of failure. You know, and uh, even just giving people downtime, I think boredom can be a great way <laughs> to just, you know, give people a chance, a breather from their studies to focus on uh, starting up their enterprises. So maybe you create independent study time where they can devote towards uh, their startup or generating startup ideas. And for schools that are re restricted by resources, it doesn't have to be, you know, full credit courses. These can be, uh, you know, sort of extracurricular or independent activity type, uh, three short, you know, three credit short courses and things. Uh, there's many different ways. But uh, once you have managed to develop a culture for entrepreneurship on your campus and students have embraced that as their identity. Uh, identity gives purpose. So they will then, you know, have expectations about their future that could be quite different uh, than when they originally arrived to the university. I know that happened with me. Um, and, you know, lastly I'd say, of course, networking and cross-campus initiatives we at the MIT Entrepreneurship Center used to print these small cards and find the engineering events in places, you know, all the pockets and clusters where we were not reaching and go in, introduce ourselves, be the oddball in the room, hand out little cards, inviting people to the business school to create community around uh, entrepreneurship at the school.